with me to see if that works a little bit better. Greetings. I'm glad to be here. I hope you're glad to be here. I've enjoyed our time, and my topic was how to be happy. We've had these three guys before tell us how not to be happy. Uh, Jameson did give us a little hint. He told me I'd be happier if I took off my ties, so I did that, tried to get a little more comfortable. Yeah, but uh, I can't tell they tell my happiness a whole lot, Jameson. <laughs> I am glad to be here with you and want to talk with you about what the Bible says about being happy. Now, if you know me very well, you will know that one of my favorite whipping posts as a preacher is the health, wealth, and prosperity preachers like your Joel Osteens. They get on there and they tell you how to live your best life now and how to be happy all the time. So there's a little bit of irony in me being up here talking to you about being happy. But uh, the Bible does talk about being happy. Let me ask you this. Do you want to be like Jesus? It's okay to nod your head at least if you don't want to say yes. Do you want to be like Jesus? Yes? All of us want to be like Jesus, don't we? We claim to be Christians, don't we? What's the word Christian mean? It means like Christ. That's what the word means. You want to be like Jesus? Yes. So let me ask you a question. Was Jesus happy? Do you think Jesus was happy? I can remember reading in the Bible that Jesus wept one time when His friend died. Have you ever wept at the funeral of a friend? I have. Is that happy? Did you know that not one place in the Bible does it ever talk about Jesus laughing? Never is it mentioned one time that Jesus laughed. Now do you think that means He never laughed? No, I, I don't think that necessarily means He never laughed. The Bible doesn't talk about Jesus laughing. You know what the Bible does say about Jesus? In describing Him, it describes Him like this. He says, when we see Him, there is no beauty that we should desire Him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised and we did not esteem Him. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. One of the things Carrie and I like to do when we travel around sometimes, we'll see an old cemetery, and we like to stop and look around and read the gravestones. I know that may be a little morbid, and as I get older I may like it less, but I think it's kind of interesting. And sometimes when we do that, I think about what would I like on my gravestone? And I promise you, never one time have I thought, oh, man of sorrows, that'd be a great thing to put on my gravestone. Or stricken and smitten by God. Man, that'd be good. Is that what you want to be like? We're talking about happiness here. Do you think a man of sorrows was happy? Do you think someone who's despised and carried our sorrows and was afflicted, was happy? Look at what Jesus Himself said about this to His disciples. He said, These things have I spoken to you that My joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. The answer to that question is yes, Jesus was happy in a biblical sense. In a sense of biblical happiness, Jesus was. Now I know when we talk about happiness, we don't think about being happy when we just got fired from our job or when that idiot Bruce was talking about runs you off the road just about. We don't think about being happy when our kids are really in serious trouble. We don't think about being happy when we have health problems. Jesus was happy in a biblical sense in all of those times, in all of those situations. In, all, in fact, do you know 
that even as Jesus went to the cross, the Bible says that He was under such tremendous stress that He cried out to God and His sweat was like blood. The Bible talks about that cup of grief that He had to drink and it calls it agony and despair. Do you know what the Bible says about Jesus during that particular time? It says this. It says, Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. Now was it fun to hang on that cross? Do you think it was fun when they put that crown of thorns on His head and banged it down on there? Think that was fun? That wasn't fun. Going to Six Flags, I've been to Six Flags, that can be fun. This was not fun. Being here with you all today, eating that good food that the ladies prepared for us, that was fun, wasn't it? Yes? Sitting around visiting with my friends and people that I like and people that like me, that's fun. Getting beat to within an inch of your life and thrown in a prison cell at, mid at midnight, is that fun? But you got the Apostle Paul and Silas laying in a cold prison cell in the middle of the night after being beaten. And you know what they're doing? They're singing praises to God. That's weird, isn't it? I mean, isn't that weird? It seems weird to us because I'm going to tell you something. What Bruce talked about, I am like that. I mean, I get up some days and I've got a good day going on and some little something happens. And you know, I just get grumpy the rest of the day from that. What happened? You know, we've had several good talks today and they have taught us that biblical happiness is not found in sin. I want you to know that Ian said it's fun to commit sin. That's a direct quote from Ian. It's fun to commit sin. <laughs> well, I may be misrepresenting him a little bit. But... People don't do it because it isn't fun. They have a good time committing sin. They do. But lasting joy, biblical happiness, doesn't come from that. It doesn't come from circumstances. Jameson talked to us about circumstances. People that have just start getting checks in the mail for $100,000 a month. I mean, that's a circumstance, isn't it? That bring real, lasting, genuine joy. We know that. We know that biblical happiness is not momentary. It's not temporary. It's not something you're happy for a little bit and then you get upset. And then you're not happy and you're sad and you're despondent and you're discouraged. That's not biblical happiness. And I tell you another thing biblical happiness isn't that we haven't talked a lot about this morning. And that's emotional froth. That emotional excitement. That, that woo! That's not biblical happiness. That may be fun, but it's not biblical happiness. Biblical happiness is found in forgiveness. There is real and genuine joy in knowing that you know that you know that you're forgiven. There's real joy in that. There's real joy. But when that joy comes, it comes from within. It doesn't come from the circumstances surrounding us. We're going to talk about that in a minute. It comes in a way that's lasting. It's not just, okay, I had a good couple of weeks, but now I'm back in my funk. It's not that way. It's lasting and genuine. And we find that it is a righteous choice that you can make. You can choose this way of biblical joy. Now, honestly, that seems pretty simple, doesn't it? I mean, what we talk, you know that, don't you? I mean... When you heard Jameson talk, did he really convince you that genuine happiness isn't found in money and stuff? Didn't you know that already? I mean, I appreciate Not that I didn't like you talking. I appreciated it. And it was great reminders. But the truth is, I already knew that. 
And you did too, right? Did Ian really convince you that the secret to happiness isn't to go get drugs? Now there are different crowds that Jameson and Ian could preach that to that wouldn't know that. But this crowd, you knew that, didn't you? Did Bruce really have to convince you that genuine, true happiness is in Jesus? Did he have to convince you that or did you already know that? My guess is, you know the old phrase, preach into the choir? <laughs> My guess is today we're preaching to the choir, right? All this is stuff you already know, right? It's really not that hard. It's pretty simple. And if that's the case, then why aren't you happy? I say, well, I mean I am. Don't say I'm not happy. You don't know me that well. Maybe not. My guess is though, we've got someone here today who knew all of that stuff and you're not happy. What do you do? Y'all know who Madonna is or is that just betraying my age? That singer, Madonna? Is, can you shake your heads yes or no? Do y'all know who she is? Okay. She was very, very successful. Financially, she's very successful in fame and all these things. She was being interviewed a while back and someone asked her about being happy and she kind of indicated that she really wasn't happy. They said, you're not happy? She said, I don't even know anyone who's happy. She didn't even know anybody that's really happy. And I have to be honest and tell you that I think I'm happy, biblically happy. But I've also had those times. And you, Brother Lindell, had those times? Are you sitting on the edge of the bed shaking your head going, this has got to stop. This is not going where I wanted it. My life is not what I thought it was going to be. What do we do? How can we actually find some happiness? You know, Israel, back in 536 B.C., they were there in Jerusalem and they had the temple and the temple just dominated the whole area of Jerusalem was huge. And it didn't matter what kind of day you had, you could open those mini blinds in your little mud hut in Jerusalem and you could look out the window and you'd see those big stone walls and they were the evidence that God loved you because He was your God. He was your God and you were His people and you knew that every day. And that was... Wouldn't that be reassuring? I mean, I wear a wedding ring and I wear a wedding, a wedding ring because, well, it's cultural that we do that. But, you know, it's to remind me of my vows. But you know what else it reminds me of? I got somebody that loves me. I got someone who's committed themselves to me. And no matter what goes on in my life, I got someone that loves me. And I've got evidence of that. I wear it around with me all the time. That's what the temple was for Israel. Do you know what happened? 536 B.C.? There was a guy all the way across the desert named Nebuchadnezzar. And he was a bad dude. And he brought his armies over and they destroyed Jerusalem. And they tore that temple down stone by stone. And they took all the gold that was in that temple to serve the true and living God and they took it and just put it in the treasure house of the king. And they took all those people that had God. And He was their God. And He was with them and defended them. And they knew all the stories about Egypt and Joshua and all the great victories. And He took those people and He made them slaves. And He drug them across the desert. And they sat by the rivers of Babylon. And Psalm 127 tells that story about how they sat there by the rivers of Babylon. Now, do you know what the word Jerusalem means? Jerusalem means peace. That's what it means. Do you know what Babylon means? It means confusion. The Tower of Babel, where God confused languages. That's what the word Babylon means. And so yesterday, they were in Jerusalem in peace. Today, they wake up and look around and they're in Babylon. They're in confusion. You can identify with that, can't you? I mean, you got the phone call, or there was the knock on the door, 
or you got the report from the doctor. And it doesn't take that long to go from peace to confusion, does it? It's one missed paycheck, one MRI, and you can go from peace to confusion, can't you? You've been there. What did these people do? You know what they did? The Bible says, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. You know what they did? They had a pity party. They just sat down and they wept and they felt bad and they were discouraged and they didn't know what to do. Our world is collapsed. Our world is over. Are you worried about America, by the way? You concerned about America? I'm concerned about America. You know what? These people already lost it. Their country was already gone, already burned to the ground. So what do they do? They sit and weep. They didn't have joy. They lost that. Why? Because their mind and their focus was on the wrong place. So what do you do when you're in that moment, when you're in that place? Because I don't need to really tell you how to be happy today because you're happy today. You've got plenty to eat and you're here with your friends and your family and you're satisfied today, probably. What do you do when you're not? How do you deal with it? Well, we're going to look at four particular things, okay? We're going to talk about action, talk about attitude, talk about focus, and talk about gratitude. Let's talk about action. Number one, if you want to be happy, you need to avoid choices that bring sorrow and regret and remorse and shame into your life. We've had a lot of talk about that. And I can tell you this much. You, your happiness has a lot to do with the choices that you make. And when you choose stuff that make you unhappy, you choose stuff that brings chaos and shame and guilt and remorse and regret into your life, guess what you're going to have? God's not mocked. You're going to reap what you sow. And you're going to have guilt and remorse and shame and regret in your life. That's what you're going to have when you make those choices. If you want to be happy, what you want to do is you want to choose to make choices or you want to do things that make you rise. Look at what David said. How David... And by the way, you know who King David was, right? He's really famous for a couple of things. Probably one of the biggest things that he's famous for is committing adultery and murder. Because that's what he did. He committed adultery and then murder. And he's real well known for that. And he hid it. Tried to hide it. It eventually came out as it always does, but he tried to hide it. And look at this. Here's what he said. He said, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Y'all have drought of summer around here? Ever? He said, my vitality, my joy. He said, every bit of it was gone. My bones grew old through my groaning. I know... Maybe you've not been involved in the things that Ian was talking about with the drugs and alcohol. But I know you've seen it on television. You've seen it in a movie. And I know this, and Ian, you can tell me if I'm wrong. You've seen guys sitting on the edge of the bed the next morning going, this has got to stop. Why? Their bones are growing old. Why? Because they're choosing things that bring shame and guilt and remorse and regret into your life. And I want to tell you this. People feel guilty because they are guilty. That's why people feel guilty. You're ashamed of things you've done in your life? You should be ashamed of those things. They're not righteous and they're not good. Shame and guilt and remorse, those are just an indication that your emotional system that God designed you with are working. When we do stuff that's shameful, we ought to be ashamed of it. When we do stuff that's wrong, we ought to feel guilty about it. And if you don't, you've got a problem. 
But you see, this remorse and regret, listen, regret can destroy your life. Regret can make you never, ever stand up and do anything for God. Because everything you do, you know, the Bible says that Satan, his name is Satan. You know what Satan means? It means accuser. He's an accuser. And you know what he will do with your guilt? Is every time you try to stand up, you try to do something, you try to speak up, he's going to say, who are you? Who do you think you are? I know what you did. You know what you did. And it will destroy your effectiveness. It will destroy your, your spiritual vitality and your strength. And your bones will grow old. Young people especially, but all of us, we need to remember what David said, the way of the transgressor is hard. Well, actually, I think this was Solomon, the son of David. The way of the transgressor is hard. It is not an easy life. And if you want to be happy, number one, the actions that you perform in your life, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. You're going to reap what you sow. Don't choose things that are going to bring remorse and regret and guilt and shame into your life. Number two, choose your attitude. Rejoicing is a command. Did you know that in your New Testament it says women be silent in the church two times? Did you know that? Do we believe that passage? Yes? No? Yes, we believe that passage. I, I guarantee you if we show up at the Boca Chetta Church of Christ tomorrow and that passage isn't obeyed, somebody's going to speak up. Right? We believe that verse, right? That same Bible tells you five times to not be anxious but to rejoice. You rejoice? We're told over and over and over to rejoice. When's the last time you rejoiced in the Lord? I said, well, you know, I've been moved a couple of times. I got moved a little bit, you know, when old Bruce was up here, you know, how he does. That kind of moved me a little bit. I had a little rejoicing in my... God commands you to choose rejoicing. Look at what Scripture says in Romans chapter 5. Paul said, We also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. He said, When I have trouble, I glory in the trouble. Now, that didn't mean he didn't ask God to make the trouble go away. We know from 2 Corinthians he did. He besought God and said, Make this thorn in the flesh go away, please. And God said, You know what? Quit bothering me about this. My grace is sufficient for you because my strength is shown in your weakness. And Paul said he learned that lesson. He learned it. He learned the lesson of rejoicing in trouble and tribulation. And it wasn't just Paul that said this. You know, James, the brother of Jesus, by the way, James had a, a nickname. Do you all know his nickname? James, the brother of Jesus, his nickname was Old Camel Knees. That's a weird nickname, isn't it? Old Camel Knees. You know why his nickname was that? Because James believed in doing what he said. And James spent so much time on his knees praying that they say his knees were all calloused up like a camel's. Well, they called him Old Camel Knees. Well, you know what? Old Camel Knees wrote a letter and he wrote it to Christians, Jewish Christians, all throughout the world at that time. And look at how he starts that letter. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Do you do that? That's a, one, that's a weird way to start a letter. Rejoice, count it joy when you have trouble. I've never started a letter like that. What does he mean? Does he mean if Carrie and I get in the car and head to Dallas and I have a flat tire, I'm supposed to go, Yeah! I had a flat tire! And I'm supposed to jump up and down and dance a jig? I wouldn't do that anyway, but I mean, Bruce might. But... What does that mean? 
count it all joy. You see, when you go looking at it, you read it, notice what it says. It doesn't say, jump up and down and be happy. He says, count it joy. That word count means consider. It means you take whatever you're looking at, and you look at it from this angle, and then you come around here and you look at it from this angle, and then you go around and you look at it from here, and then you come all the way around over here and you look at it, and you carefully consider it, and then you say, that's joy. That is joy. Why? Why are trouble joy? Well, it's because of what Paul said. James says the same thing. The trying of your faith is going to work patience. And patience is going to make you grow up as a Christian. We had some birds made a nest in a little bush outside our front window. And I watched that all through the year, you know. And the little birdies get, you know, I start to say get born, but the eggs hatch. And the eggs hatch and they've got the little birds and mom and daddy bird come and they poke those little baby birds full of all kinds of birdie goodness like gnats and worms and good things and they'd sit there and chirp. And, but you know, there was a morning that mama bird got mean. And she got in that nest and just pushed those little birds out. And you know what happened when she pushed those little birds out? Whoa! As they... Hey, that's pretty cool. I got, I got wings. I can fly. And the birds learn to fly. You know, if you never face trouble and you never face problems and you never face difficulties, you'll never grow. You'll never know that you have a faith that will carry you through. You know, Abraham learned about his faith on Mount Moriah when God said, kill your son. Moses learned about his faith when he's backed up against the Red Sea and the Egyptian army's there and he's got no retreat. Daniel learned about his faith when he's in a lion's den. And I can tell you from my life, and I think most of you will bear this out, is that the times I grow spiritually are the times I have tough times. I don't grow a whole lot when times are good. But when times are bad... When times are tough and times are difficult, I grow. And guess what? You know what I want to do? I want to grow. That's what I want. And so guess what? That's joy because that causes me to grow up. And ultimately, when we talk about biblical happiness, joy is what we're talking about, right? Number three, focus. Whatever you focus on, will be multiplied in your life experience. That's just common sense. We know that. When I first moved to Dallas, I built six and eight foot privacy fences, these big cedar fences around people's backyards. That's what I did for a living. I built fence. You know what I noticed everywhere I went? People's fences. I noticed them everywhere I went. And then after I did that for a while, I roofed houses. And you know what I noticed everywhere I went? People's roofs. And I bought my wife a white minivan. And you know what I noticed everywhere I went? White minivans. And I have a little two-year-old, beautiful, sweet little angel of a grandbaby that never does anything wrong. And you know what I notice everywhere I go are these beautiful little two-year-old kids that never do anything. Well, some of them aren't as sweet as my granddaughter, but whatever you focus on, you're going to notice. That's just the way God designed us. Whatever you think about a lot, you're going to notice a lot. When I go somewhere, my wife will ask me if she's traveling with me. She'll say, okay, well, how do they dress? Sorry, babe. <laughs> I'm not a lot of help. I can't, I can't tell you if all the women had dresses or that some of them had pants or they all had pants. I, can't, I don't notice that stuff. I, do, I just don't know. But she notices. She pays attention to that stuff. Whatever you focus on is going to be multiplied in your life experience. In other words, you're going to see it. Have you ever known anyone who had a chip on their shoulder? You know what I'm talking about? 
a chip on their shoulder, and they walk around expecting people to disrespect them. Right? You know what they see everywhere they go? People disrespecting them. That's what they see all the time. You show up somewhere and you expect people not to like you, guess what? You're going to find a bunch of people don't like you. And if they do, you'll make some excuse of why, well, you know, they were the exception that proves the rule. Whatever you focus on will be multiplied in your life experience. So what does the Bible tell us? Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. Have you ever heard the term stinking thinking? You ever heard that term? If you sit around and think about negative, bad, unhappy stuff all the time, you're going to have negative, bad, unhappy experiences around you that are in your face all the time. You just will. That's the way God made it. Ian and I were talking at the break about TV shows. You know what? I've gotten where I don't I don't like to watch TV shows that are about crime and stuff like that. About them kidnapping little kids and all. You know why? I've got a grandbaby. And I worry about that stuff. And the more those TV shows I see, the more I think, I hope they don't let her go out in the, out in the front yard by herself. <laughs> because that's multiplied in our life experience, as you see. Focus on things above and not on things on this earth. That's what Jameson was telling you. Don't focus on money and stuff like that. If you do, it'll eat your world. And you'll get to the end and you ain't got nothing except monopoly money. Focus on things above and not on things on this earth. Focus on God's Word like Brother Bruce was talking about. Focus on His Word and loving His law. Talking about that. Be more interested in that than you are in the newest crime drama on TV. And your world will be much better. Look at what Paul said. Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are noble? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are good report? If there be any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You know why? Because this is what Jesus thought about. True, pure, lovely, good. Now did He know the bad existed? Yes. Did He deal with the bad? You better believe it. You doubt it, ask some of the Pharisees. Jesus dealt with that stuff. But did He sit around thinking about it? No. His focus was on what was righteous and good and faithful. So, you need to, number one, stay away from stuff that's going to give you trouble. Stay away from stuff that's going to bring regret and sorrow and shame and guilt and remorse into your life. You need to not have anything to do with those kinds of things. You need to focus your mind on what's good. You need to set or choose your attitude. And the last thing I want to tell you is you need to manage your expectations. <coughs> expectations are your enemy. They are your worst enemy for happiness is expectations. The problem with expectations is that when I expect something, when I feel like I'm entitled to it, when there's an entitlement mentality in my mind and I don't get it, guess what happens? Let me give you an example. If I come home at the end of the day and I expect my wife to have a hot meal on the table when I walk in the door, and I walk in the door and there's a hot meal on the table, what do I think? Well, that's what it's supposed to be, right? what I expect. She's doing what I expect her to do. What happens if I walk in the door and there's not a hot meal sitting on the table? Well, I'm upset now. I told her she knows. There ought to be a hot meal on that table. It's what I expect. I'm out here working, supporting this family. You get a hot meal on And guess what we've got in my house? World War III. What we've got in my house. Now, let's change my expectation. 
Make everything the same. Just change my expectation. I go out and I work, and I come home, and I expect to have to dig around in the refrigerator for some bologna to make myself a sandwich. And I get home, and I walk in, and I have to dig around in the refrigerator to get myself some bologna and make a sandwich. Guess what I think? It's the way it's supposed to be. It's the way it always is. It's the way life is. Am I upset about it? That's what I expected. Just the way things are. But let's say I walk in the house and there's a hot meal on the table. Ooh. Did you wreck the car? <laughs> What's going on here? No, I just love you and I wanted to have a hot meal ready. Now all of a sudden, I have room for gratefulness. Right? Now the only thing that changed in that scenario was my expectation. <coughs> you need to manage your expectations. I teach at a private Christian school and I've got high school kids. I teach Bible in high school. And I call my kids snowflakes. In fact, so much so that they call themselves snowflakes now. You know what a snowflake is, right? A snowflake is something that looks pretty and melts when there's any bit of heat. They just can't take any heat. And anytime I give them a test or a quiz, or, oh, Mr. McCorkle, I say, shut up, you snowflakes, and get out your pencils. Because they're just weak because their expectations are that life's always going to be good that everything's going to smell good and I'm going to wear my ear pods and, or air pod, what do you call them? And I'm always going to have my tunes in my ear and I'm always going to have the clothes I want to wear and I'm always going to get to eat the food that I want to eat and Ed, nobody's going to gossip about me and everything's going to be good. And when you expect that, you are setting yourself up to be miserable your whole life. Because that's just not the way it works. You see, one time when, when my kids were young, we were uh, talking about something, and one of my kids, we made, we made some rule. I don't even remember what it was. Some, something we said we were going to do, and one of my kids said, That's not fair! That's not fair! We just happened to be sitting in front of a restaurant, and this fellow was rolling out of the restaurant in a wheelchair, and he had one of these kind of wheelchairs where he was paralyzed from the neck down, but he had a little thing he could blow into this little deal and control that wheelchair. And I made my kids sit and watch that man take about 15 minutes to get 30 feet to a van that was a handicap accessible van and get some help and get in that van and get up and I said, don't you ever tell me life isn't fair to you again. And I want to tell you, my kids got real tired of me reminding them of that man. I said, you know what? It's not fair that you have parents. A bunch of people don't have parents. It's not fair you're not sleeping under a bridge tonight. Because a lot of people are sleeping under a bridge tonight. It's not fair you weren't born under a bush in Africa because a bunch of people were born under bushes in Africa. It's not fair that you don't have cancer because there's a bunch of people got cancer. You see, expectations are a real problem. To... I saw this picture. It is so, so descriptive to me. you got this young lady and I mean she's... You can tell she's from an upwardly mobile young family. She's got an iPhone and she's got a Netflix account and a Louis Vuitton purse and she has her dance lessons every day and she is absolutely angry and miserable because her parents made her go to Chick-fil-A today instead of wherever it was she wanted to eat. Then you got this kid down here in Nigeria and he's got a square rock. And that's his camera. And he's got a, he and all his friends have a smile from ear to ear. What's the difference in those but expectations? I heard on the radio just last week about a 22-year-old guy who was given a BMW for his birthday. 
and he pushed it in a lake because it wasn't the kind of car he wanted. It's expectations, you see. And expectations will cause you a lot of problems. You know what you need to expect? If you're a good soldier, you're going to suffer persecution. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, they hated me and they're going to hate you. That's what you and I need to expect. We sit here and we bemoan and whine and are all upset about the direction of our country. You ought to expect that's going to happen. Sin is going to get worse and worse. There is going to be persecution in America against Christians. It's going to happen. When it happens, what are you going to do? You're going to be a snowflake and quit? That's not where joy is. Well, I'm not happy. I have people come to me, Christian people, people at least who claim Christianity, and we counsel and they sit here and they say, I'm going to divorce my husband because I'm not happy and I know God doesn't want me to be unhappy. I tell you, that's, that's the source of their unhappiness right there. You're going to have trouble and you're going to have problems and you're going to have trials and you're going to have difficulties in this life. But joy isn't based on the circumstantial feelings. Manage your expectations. When I say manage them, you know what I mean? I mean expect what God tells you to expect instead of expect what you want. Expect what God says is really the case in this world instead of what we want. David said this, do not let your heart envy sinners. And you know how David dealt with his expectations. He said this, all my expectations are of you talking to God. He said, you know what? I just quit expecting stuff from people. I don't expect anything from anyone else. I just expect from God. That's where all my expectations are. And you know what? If I have expectations that my wife will do this and this and this and this and she doesn't and I'm angry, that ruins my day and ruins my joy. If instead, I don't expect anything from her, but I expect from God, and He gives me a wife that does this and this and this, I go, praise you. Hallelujah. You didn't have to do that for me, God. How wonderful that you fill my life with this blessing. So how do you be happy? We could talk about lots of other things. But these... Step number one, your actions. Just stay away from stuff that's going to bring heartache into your life. Step number two, adjust your attitude so it's like the attitude of Jesus Christ. Step number three, focus on things above, on good, pure, lovely, instead of focusing on all the evil and the bad and what's going to happen if we have an economic downturn and what's going to happen if that guy's elected president and if they take our guns away from us and, and all this stuff, it's just going to make you unhappy. Focus on the real blessings of God and His Word. We're worrying about this world. Amen. And step number four, learn to be grateful. Learn some gratitude. Adjust your expectations so that they're with Jesus Christ and God. You know, sometimes you hear a guy talk and he'll say, if you only remember one thing, here's the one thing I want you to remember. Well, I'm going to say that, and I think this one thing summarizes what we've all been talking about today. This one thing, if you can just remember this, you will keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because He trusts in you. There was a stage in all my children's lives when they got afraid of the dark. They didn't like the dark. And we have a two-story house and they had to go upstairs and at night I'd say, okay, time to go to bed upstairs. And they'd get to that landing and they'd turn and look up and it was dark. And they did not want to go up into the dark. And they would turn back around and they'd say, Daddy, it's dark up there. I'd say, yeah, but you've got to go to bed. Will you go up there with me? And I'd get up and I'd walk over to the stairs and I would take their hand and I would walk up into the darkness with them. And you know what they did? They walked into the dark with me. You know why? Because they trusted Daddy. 
They thought Daddy could kill whatever monster might be under the bed and protect them. Little did they know. But they believed that. They trusted me, and because they trusted me, they had the peace and the courage to go into the darkness. I'm going to tell you, out of all that we've talked about, this happiness, you want real peace, you want real joy, trust God. If you trust God, He'll give you joy, He'll give you peace. You will have that joy and peace, and you don't have that to the, the, to the degree that you don't trust Him. You trust Him. Take His hand go into the darkness. Take His hand and look whatever's coming, whatever persecution or health problems or challenges you've got, and just take them head on because, as the old song says, put your hand in the hand of the man that stilled the waters. You're walking hand in hand with God. And He's got this. He's got it under control. My son, who's 17, will tell him, or he's 18 now, just turned 18, he'll tell his friends, I got you, man. I got your back. God says that. He's got us. You just put your hand in His. Do you have that peace? We've been talking about that. Do you have that happiness? Or are you one of those who's going, man, my life is, I, I don't have peace. Well, they told me they would like me to give an invitation, and my invitation to you is this. Do you trust the Lord? Do you trust Him enough to walk with Him, to do what He's asked you to do? It was said in Scripture, whoever trusts the Lord, happy is He. What about you? Do you trust God? Are you ready to serve Him? Have you not been? We're going to sing a song of invitation. Mike, are you leading that song? Okay. Everybody grab your songbook. We're going to sing an invitation song. And the purpose for this invitation song right now is this. Maybe you've been touched today and you've said, you know what, I don't have peace and I need it. I want it in my life. I'm ready to quit trusting me and start trusting God. Maybe that's you. If there's any way we can help you be right with God so you have the peace of God that passes all understanding in your heart and your life, please make your way to the front and make that known while we stand and sing.